The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All-Hit Radio! Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the X-Zone, everyone. That's the Bare Naked Ladies with one little slip. We're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. 1-800-610-7035, worldwide, toll-free. Email xown at xownradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, xownradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website, www.xownradiotv.com. And our archives are available by podcast at xzonepodcast.com. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is Dr. Ronald R. Burleson. He is the New Mexico State Director for MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, for which he is also an exam-certified field investigator, consultant, and research specialist. He is a professional mathematician, a semi-retired college teacher, and a widely published writer, being the author of 22 books, including... UFOs and the Murder of Marilyn Monroe and UFO Secrecy and the Fall of J. Robert Oppenheimer. He and his wife Molly live in Roswell, New Mexico, the place certainly to be if you're uh, into ufology. His website is www.blackmesapress.com. And uh, Dr. Don, welcome to the Exxon. Great having you with us today, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. Tell me, Dr. Don, how did you get involved or where does your interest in UFOs originate from? Well, actually, uh, I guess in a way you could say I got involved in it the best possible way through direct experience. Wow. Uh, I, had a, uh, I had a UFO sighting myself when I was five and a half years old. Mm-hmm. I was over in uh, Breckenridge, Texas, which is where I was born, and uh, we were at my grandmother's house, and I was um, out on her back porch. And when the, you know, the, my parents and my grandparents were inside, and um, I was out there by myself, and this thing came across the sky. And, right. Uh, I only had it in sight for about a second and a half, maybe, but uh, it was enough to whip my interest, that was for sure, and I really didn't know what to make of it. Um, It wasn't really until I started seeing things like UFO movies in the early 1950s that I that I really realized that other people had seen. This, this sighting of mine was actually on July 4, 1947, uh, the same night as wow. the Roswell incident, but 300 miles east of Roswell. And so, you know, in those days, you know, nobody really talked about UFOs. And, of course, I didn't read a newspaper or anything as a kid of five or six years old. So it wasn't really until the 50s that I started finding out that maybe I wasn't crazy. Maybe other people saw things like that, too. And, of course, eventually I began reading books about UFOs and so forth, and it went from there. Did you really think that there was something wrong with you because you had seen this this object in the sky for one and a half seconds? I kind of had to wonder. I mean, after all, you know, little kids are kind of used to, uh, you know, not being taken terribly seriously, I guess, you know, by by adults. In fact, I didn't really even talk to my my folks about it. I just thought, well, you know, I saw something in the sky, and I don't know what in the Mm -hmm. world it was. But, you know, you're not supposed to see stuff in the sky that you can't, you can't identify. You know, I knew that, that it wasn't an airplane. It wasn't anything familiar, you know. But, um, I guess I just didn't have the, uh, you know, the presence right. of mind at that age to realize that, yeah, you can be sane and still see something anomalous, you know. Doctor, you and I have to take our first commercial break for this hour. Please stand by, Exo Nation. Our special guest this hour is Dr. Donald Burleson. As I said, he is the New, New Mexico State Director for MUFON. That's the Mutual UFO Network. And for more information on how you can purchase... Uh, 
uh, Dr. Don's books. They're available at blackmesapress.com. That's blackmesapress.com. And uh, Dr. Don and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break in two minutes as we continue to talk about UFOs this hour here in the X-Zone from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, you can always go to the X-Chronicles newspaper newsstand and read any of the any of the editions that we have up there. I believe there's nearly 30 uh, past editions up uh, on the uh, website. That's www.xchronicles-newspaper.com forward slash publisher. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break in two minutes. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone broadcast network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Exonation, uh, Dr. Donald Burleson is our special guest. He's the New Mexico State Director for MUFON. And uh, Dr. Don, why are you so confident that some UFO cases are real? Well, actually, um, <clears throat> we've got some very reliable witnesses. You do have mm-hmm. to depend on a witness account, of course, most of the time. A UFO right. investigator can't always, in fact, almost can never manage to be in the right place at the right time to actually see an event like that but we have you know for example we have ufo reports submitted by pilots you know i mean i mean a pilot uh, is trained to be to be an accurate observer you know trained to look at something in the sky and say okay you know i can estimate i can give you a good estimate of distance mm-hmm. altitude size speed you know uh, that's that's not an idle report that's actually something pretty pretty perceptive and uh we also we have we have reports of course that have high consistency from multiple observers. You know, for example, well the the, the Phoenix Lights, you yes. know, of, uh, March thirteenth, nineteen ninety seven. I mean that we have hundreds of witnesses to that, and they all pretty much tell a story that fits together. You know, it, it, when it, just talking about the Phoenix Lights, why do you think that? To this very day, there hasn't been a definitive answer from any branch of the government as to what the phoenix lights were i mean you've got the you've got the story that came out that it was part of a national guard training exercise and they were flares that were jettisoned Uh, and and, you know so many people who were witness to the phoenix lights take that and say come on we're not we're not silly you know we can tell the difference between a flare and, and an object that is so big moving at a consistent speed with no sound well you know the simple fact is the government knows perfectly well that something like that event was anomalous I mean, but they don't want to tell you that because basically it means they have to admit that there's there's uh, really scary stuff in our, our space that we can't do anything about, and they're not really in control because mm-hmm. there it is and you can't get rid of it, you know. I mean, they really don't like to, 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 to confess to that, and they really, you know, don't uh, don't much care even if they know that you know they're lying. Is the fact, you know, you said because there's scary stuff, is is it the government's belief that people believe that UFOs are scary, or is that the rationale for keeping the information that they already have at hand a secret? Well, I think in a sense, anything, anything that's not supposed to be in airspace mm-hmm. is scary. You know, I mean, I mean, airports, for example, are supposed to pretty much know what's in the air. Exactly. And, you know, when there's something there, like, like for example, that, that famous incident at O'Hare yeah. Airport in Chicago, you know, that's not supposed to be there, uh, whether it's posing a threat to anybody or not, just the fact that it shouldn't be there at all, you know, is, is a little disturbing. And, and of course, uh, the implication for government is it's there and we're supposed to be in control of the airspace, but we can't really do anything about things like that. You know, with all the UFO sightings that have happened and been reported since the Roswell incident going back to 1947. 
There have not been, to my knowledge, and please collect, uh, correct me if I'm right, uh, Dr. Don, any evidence that would support a hypothesis that these UFOs or the occupants are hostile towards Earth? No, there doesn't seem to be, you know, any indication yeah. of that. Um, I, my, my feeling has always been if they, if they wanted to, to, to make mincemeat of us, you know, they already yeah. would have. Exactly. I think because I, I, I think it's fairly probable that they could, you know, mm-hmm. if they wanted to, given the, uh, given the technology we've seen. I mean, we've seen objects that can make a right angle turn at 20,000 miles an hour. You know, I mean, with that kind of that kind of technology, they could probably do us harm if they wanted to. And the fact that they haven't, you know, sort of suggests to me that they don't want to. All right. So then, my question would be to the government. Well, you know, I just we could just reiterate what we were talking about this uh, this very moment and say, well, wait a minute, nobody's ever been attacked. So how do you, you know, why not just tell us the truth of what you know? All right, you know, they're in our airspace. Yeah. You can control it. You don't know how they do it. Let's right. solve the problem and face it. Well, see, the, the problem with, you know, one, one of the frequent questions that always comes up is, mm-hmm. why does a cover-up go on? You know, I mean, I mean, actually, it was fairly natural in 1947 when the Roswell object crashed. Um, You're talking about the world? unknown. It was kind of a first, yeah. you know, and I can imagine President Truman saying, hey, you know, before we say anything about this, we better have a look at everything and yeah. better find out kind of what we can, we can, we can learn about it. But you know, in fact, I've always wondered if if maybe if if, I, if uh, Eisenhower hadn't replaced Truman in 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 the White House, I've often wondered if maybe Truman might not have actually uh, decided to end the cover up. That's he a was good, kind of an open that... sort of guy. But but mm-hmm. see, the trouble is, that as time goes on, it gets to be a bigger and bigger lie, and actually, now it's probably too late. It's probably too late for them to come mm-hmm. clean about it. And in fact, I, I, I hesitate to even use the term "come clean" because, <laughs> you know, there isn't anything clean about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as, as they say, some things don't have a clean end to pick them up by. Right. You know, and um, and basically, just there's been too much water under the proverbial bridge by mm-hmm. now. And there, there's been too much lying. People have been killed. Documents have been um, illegally destroyed. Uh, people have been threatened. And there's just been too much bad behavior on the part of government for them to say, "Oh well, okay, hey, listen, we're gonna we're gonna tell you everything now. We'd like you to keep voting for us anyway." So why did it take so long, sir, after the the crash in Roswell? Why did it take a book by Stanton Friedman before this all surfaced again and caught the imagination and caught the ear of America and followed by the ear of the world? Well, basically, they told everybody to keep quiet. You know, I mean, they clamped the lid down on it, and they they made it clear they were quite serious. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know of people who received death threats, um, and uh, it wasn't really until Stanton uh, talked to Jesse Marcel uh, in 1978 that uh, that that you know some of the witnesses started saying well hey look you know i mean they didn't kill jesse when he came out and talked you know so maybe we could maybe we could start talking mm-hmm. about it too uh they made it very clear from the beginning they didn't want anybody talking about it i mean when they tell you that you kind of have to take them seriously what evidence sir have you seen that you draw the conclusion that there actually was a UFO crash in Roswell, New Mexico. Well, I think actually some of the best evidence may be uh, in the process of uh, of appearing, even even as we speak. Um, there are some metals that have been found out at the debris field mm-hmm. uh, that have that are undergoing uh, testing. Um, and see, for example, if you if you look at things like um, the magnesium isotope ratios in in metals uh those are basically 79% 10% 11% distributed between between uh, magnesium 24 25 and 26 respectively if something belongs to this solar system uh for something that belongs to a different star system you know the the ratios could be very different and uh actually the preliminary tests on some of this stuff show that the ratios may indeed be uh atypical what we're hoping to do is to have all of this testing done repeatedly and corroborating, you know, one test corroborating another by 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 having different different outfits examine the stuff, 
but I, I think we're beginning to get some hard scientific evidence for for this now. I'm see, I'm I'm one of the hard science people in this field. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a mystic. You sure. know, I. I'm a mathematician, and I see things basically in terms of mathematics and physics, uh, and chemistry, and you know, science generally. And uh, that's that's what we really need. And I think we're I think we're in the process of getting it. All right. So we get the data, and we say, okay, look, based on the data and the scientific facts, something did crash at Roswell, New Mexico. Something that appears to be from another another planet, another solar system, whatever. Right. What is the significance of it? Well, basically, the significance is it, it, it could very well be regarded as the most significant event in human history. Um, I mean, you know, you don't have your first encounter with uh, life forms from the great outside, you know, just all the time. And that may have been the first encounter. Or, 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 or were the first encounters actually those that were talked about in the Bible, the, the encounter well, between yeah, angels, you know? These, these things, yeah, yeah, these things could have been around for centuries, but... Certainly, um, in, in modern times, this is the first time we've really had uh, a pretty clear indication right. that we're, you know, that we're onto something like that. But what would happen, sir, if the evidence came back and it's inconclusive, or the, that you know what, this very same metals are found here on this planet? Well, then we would know that. You know, basically, uh, you know, a scientist needs to follow things whichever mm-hmm. direction they go. Uh, basically, if um, if the metals being examined so far, for example, turned out to be um, consistent with terrestrial uh, isotope patterns, uh, we would just say, well, then they're from the Earth. You mm-hmm. know? Uh, and if there's any, any uh, really, really um, extraterrestrial stuff out there, we haven't found it yet. So, so maybe it's out there, maybe it isn't. You, know, you just have to look at wherever the facts lead. All right, let me ask you this, sir. W- would it be possible to change the isotope patterns of a substance found on Earth to, uh, to let me see, to um, to look as if it was from another planet. Um, I suspect it probably would. Certainly, isotope patterns are affected by mm-hmm. some things like like extreme heat. You know, for example, and radioactivity. Um, the the objectivity of a study like that mm-hmm. has to be made unquestionable. Everything has to be documented. Yeah. Uh, everything, ha- every, every way in which the no, no, sir. I'm sorry. I wasn't study. questioning the ob- objectivity. I was questioning if radioactivity could actually change the isotope pattern. Um, well, I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, uh, that's not my area of expertise. Yeah. No. Actually, why I'm asking. So I'm why sure I'm asking that, that is because so. you know here you've got here you've got uh, the uh, wasn't the wasn't there the nuclear arsenal that was actually lifted from Roswell, New Mexico, and dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. 509th Bomb Group here right. was the only nuclear delivery team in the world at one yeah. point. So I'm just wondering if, by chance, this but metal may have... spray radiation from that stuff. Of course, we did have the, mm-hmm. the Trinity test in 1945, but that was pretty contained, you know, by and large. All right, sir, you and I have to take a commercial break. Uh, Please stand by. Great having you with us, uh, Dr. Don. ExoNation, uh, Dr. Don Burleson is our special guest. www.blackmesapress.com. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 
401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. And welcome back, everyone. Dr. Don Burleson is our special guest, www.blackmesapress. Dr. Don is the MUFON State Director for the State of New Mexico. Um... Why do you think, Dr. Don, there are so many people who do not take ufology very serious? Well, uh, I, th- I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, the, the, the attitude toward, the attitude of academia, you know, toward mm-hmm. the, the field of UFO studies has always been lukewarm to terrible, you know. There, I see, I was pretty fortunate. I mean, I'm a semi-retired college professor. Right. And I still teach, you know, a calculus course every term here at Eastern New Mexico University, and, and of course, this is Roswell, you know. When, when I applied for tenure back when I was full-time, I actually put things in my application package about being a UFO investigator and so forth, you know, and and, and, and it wasn't the kiss of death, you know. Mm-hmm. It would be at most universities. Uh, I think there's just this sense that, that, that there's always something suspicious about the anomalous. If you walk into a bookstore, you find... More often than not, you find uh, UFO books shelved alongside of um, witchcraft and tarot card reading and astrology, you know, and it isn't anything like any of that stuff. When it's done correctly, it's it's, it's hard science. At least that's the way I try to do it. But um, I think basically there's kind of, it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes, mm-hmm. you know. You know that old story about the... Sure do, yeah. Yeah, the uh, you know only only the little kid finally had the nerve, you know, to be the one to say the emperor is riding in, in the naked in the parade. Um, I think maybe a lot of people would would like to sort of take this the subject seriously, but they're they're afraid that they're they're afraid of what their their friends and neighbors and family and bosses and so forth would think. And of course, those people might be thinking the same thing. Do you think, uh, in your opinion, uh, Doctor Don, does television and Hollywood help or hamper? serious ufology well it may do a little bit of both i think certainly um i know for me personally it 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 helped me kind of kind of formulate my interest in the subject uh Mm -hmm. when when i was like i said when i was five five and a half years old i had a ufo sighting when i was nine years old i saw the movie the day the earth stood still and (laughs) It just blew me away, you know, because I, I I figured I knew. I mean, I knew it was a movie, but I thought, well, mm-hmm. if people make movies about stuff like that, there must be something to it. And I think it has, in a way, conditioned uh, people to think of the subject as something they ought to pay attention to. But then, on the other hand, you know, some of the movies that have been made are so lurid and strange, you know, that it, that it may have worked the other way too. I think a little bit of both. You know, each and every year, the city of Roswell has uh, an event based on the UFO crash in Roswell. And do you find that the carnival atmosphere that it's grown into is an asset? Well, uh, yeah, the the, the carnival atmosphere, in a way, uh, I mean, I can sort of see that, you know, people come to town and people want to have a good time. And they have to sort of, as a a matter of practicality, Mm -hmm. you know, it's... More or less inevitable that there is a, a kind of carnival atmosphere, but generally this is tempered by um, serious lectures, you know, and things of that sort. So um, I think it's good that it's a mix. I, I, w- I would say this: if there were only a carnival atmosphere, it would be tragic. But it's not only a, ca- a carnival atmosphere. You know, there is a serious mm. side to it too. I, I know that all the news reports, uh, the major media, seems to play on the woo-woo factor of the festival instead of the serious aspect that you're talking about. No, that's true. That's true. Basically, you know, if, if somebody has the uh, choice between, you know, covering, um, um, you know, the alien costumes on the street, you know, and covering a very, very serious lecture, you know, by, by major ufologists, they'll go probably for the for the flashy-looking stuff, you know, on, uh, on the street with the costumes and, and whatnot. That, I guess, is just a matter of theater, you know. Right. How many UFO reports a year do you average as the uh, director for the state of New Mexico? Well, I haven't actually gone back and computed an average. I would say probably, uh, usually, 
I can count on getting about maybe one report a week. Wow, so that's about 52 a year. Yeah. And of course, they don't all end up being uh, exceedingly interesting, mm-hmm. or they don't all end up convincing me that, that something, or convincing whatever field investigator I assign it to, that, you know, we're not always convinced of that, you know, that it was really anything um, anything bizarre. I mean, so, sometimes people will, will, will say, I saw this thing in the sky, and it had a red light over here, and a green light over here, and a white light in the middle, you know, and you have to kind of say, well, that's a that's a typical lighting pattern for an airplane, right? But then there are people who, who who give you you know sightings that really aren't that easy to explain. Probably, I think overall, you know, the, the usual statistic is something like five percent of sightings uh, really don't gel. You know, when you try to explain them conventionally. In your opinion, Doctor Don, what are some of the most important UFO cases? Oh, some of the old classics. Actually, I've worked on some of the some of the old classics. I've worked on the Lubbock Lights. Right. Uh, although I was only a child when they happened, I, I got in on the game later and, and and did some analysis, did some photo analysis on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, did some airspeed um, analysis on them. Um, certainly, certainly the Leveland, Texas case, November second, nineteen fifty seven, when an object landed on various in various places around the roadways around Leveland uh, uh, that night, and, and and the sheriff and his his team, you know, got in on it. They were they were witnesses, and they were threatened uh, by government officials to keep quiet. Although the official explanation was that it was ball lightning. Uh, why you have to keep quiet about ball lightning? I don't quite follow the no, logic of that, yeah. though, but uh, certainly that um, uh, Socorro, uh, Socorro, New Mexico, April twenty fourth. Uh, 1964, you know, the, both local and state yep. police were in on that. There's some very credible witnesses there, and I've done some analysis on that, too. There's certainly Roswell and Phoenix Lights, uh, the Stephenville, Texas event, you know, fairly recently. And there, there are, even even though the percentage of cases that are really anomalous is probably pretty small, uh, it's enough. It's enough to show that something something strange is really going on at least some of the time. In your opinion, are UFO sightings going up or are they going down? Well, they seem uh, it's a little hard to, unless you really track this over time. Mm-hmm. It, it, it kind of, of course, you have heavy times and light times, as uh, someone said to me one time. Sometimes they're around, sometimes they're not, right. apparently. But uh, I think overall they're probably uh, going up simply because uh, people are paying more attention. You know, uh, there there are a lot of we're we're getting more more photographs because, of course, you know there are more people with cameras and mm-hmm. you know phones with cameras and right. whatnot, you know, running around. Um, you tend to get them seasonally. You get more sightings during the summer simply because nobody stands around in in, in zero degree weather, you know, looking at the sky so much. But mm-hmm. but a lot of people are outside during the summer. You tend to get more sightings around cities because there are more pairs of eyes looking at the sky than in places where the population is less dense. But overall, probably, I would say the sightings are, are going up, not necessarily because there are more of them, but just because, you know, more people are seeing them. Awareness, yeah. Tell me, uh, alien abductions, we don't hear as many of those as we did five, ten years ago. Mm, yeah, again, that kind of, it's, it's like everything else, it kind of comes and goes. Really? Uh, yeah, it's just, you know, you'll get a whole rash of things, a wave of mm-hmm. one kind mm-hmm. of event or another, and then sometimes a, a paucity of them for a number of years. Yeah. Nobody knows why, really. For someone listening uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Don, what is the best way that they could actually help MUFON when it comes to reporting a UFO sighting? Well, you go to the website, you know, MUFON.com, and there's a we have a thing called the case management system, and you can uh, you can submit your report on there. Uh, depending on where you submit it, some state director or other, you know, will get that report immediately by email. Mm-hmm. And what we do is we, you know, do our best to assign it very quickly to a field investigator, and then the field investigator follows it up. But um, it's it's a pretty good system. Uh, it's it's quick. It's organized. Uh, the N in MUFON stands for network, and that's exactly you know what this is. If uh, if I need a photo analyst or if I need a chemist or something, all I have to do is write to HQ and say, who you got in your Rolodex? Right. You know, and so, yeah, people can submit these sighting reports online. But people can join MUFON. Uh, that's a, an excellent idea, you know, um, trained to be a field investigator. You know, it's a, it's a lot of fun, very rewarding. Tell me, Dr. Don, 
Why do you, Dr. Don, believe that we're being visited by by UFOs being driven by ETs? I mean, why are they here? Yeah. Well, um, like it's what? always a little tentative, you know, to, 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 to speculate a whole lot about alien psychology. Mm-hmm. You know, when we ask why do they do this or what do they want or what do they think, you know, we may be talking about a mind that is as biologically and genetically different from us as we're different from an earthworm, you know. Right. Um, there has, you know, a lot of people have speculated, for example, that uh, since Roswell happened in 1947 and there were some sightings, uh, like, for example, the famous Foo, Foo Lights, you know, in, in the, at, toward the end of World War II, yes. uh, that all of that was fairly soon after the Trinity atomic tests, and uh, there may be something to that. Uh, certainly, if I was if I were out there, kind of you know giving the Earth a look once in a while on the way by, and I, I started seeing atomic explosions, mm-hmm. I would probably wonder what are these idiots up to? Exactly. You know, and I would probably maybe come and check it out. Uh, I think there may be something to that theory. Do you think that contact will be made in the near future? I mean, I well, I don't well, mean I don't mean one on one contact. I mean. The landing in a city in the United States, Canada, or Great Britain, or Russia, where it will be covered by the major news centers, and that the conspiracy, the cover-up, if there is in fact one, won't be able to survive. That will just be over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one would one would of course um, greet an event like that with much interest. Yes. I tend to doubt that that will happen really soon i couldn't really give you a good reason for that i just don't don't get the feeling that, it, that, it, that it's about to happen um it might have happened already you know if whoever is out mm-hmm. whoever all, you know is driving these things you know really wanted to do that on yeah. the other hand uh, it may very well be the time to them as a whole psychologically different thing and they may be content to wait a thousand years to do that do you think the human race is ready for contact I'm inclined to be a little more uh, likely to say yes to that than some people are. I know there was mm-hmm. the Brookings Institute, you know, report that said there would be, you know, a lot of panic and uh, people would f- feel that their religious beliefs were being trampled upon, and, oh. you know, that that their culture was being challenged and so forth and so on. I'm inclined to think, though, that we're a little more. That might have been true in 1947. Yeah. But I'm inclined to think that we're a little more uh, resilient than that. I'm inclined to think that we could take it. You know, that we could just look at it and say, well, what do you know? You know, there are intelligent beings out there. We are in contact with them, and uh, Mm. welcome to the club. Cattle mutilation. What is your take on that, sir? Well, that's... uh that, that that could be a pretty a pretty disturbing subject. I've I've actually had some reports of those myself. Uh, I had somebody tell me a story one time from uh, from a ranch in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Uh, this chap was down here visiting, and he said that his uh, he uh, his people found um, a mutilated cow out on the out in the out in the prairie, you know, and it was in the winter, and there was a lot of snow on the ground, and there were no tracks or anything around it. And yet it had been surgically tampered with, you know, parts removed, very right. nice surgical incisions made, and, and no evidence of anybody having been standing, having stood around in the snow. So that, in other words, the suggestion was that, that you know, whatever was done to that animal was done uh, not with the feet on the ground. It was done from the air or something. Yeah. Um, there are definitely things, you know, like that. On the other hand, I had a report one time like that, and, uh, we went and checked it out, and, and and the animals all ripped to shreds, and you know, very very crudely torn apart, and so forth. Then it was a predator, obviously. So, kind of depends on the you know on the particular report. Right. Uh, you know, it if humans were being found in the condition that cattle are being found, you know, I'd I'd really worry. I would mm-hmm. really worry. Yeah, but, I think we all would. Yeah, the fact that there have been no human mutilations isn't that a isn't that a sign to not only the scientific community but the government officials that whoever are in these craft really are not there to harm us and that we're ready for that, contact. That would yeah, that would yeah. be my conclusion. And uh, for all we know, that may be the conclusion of government officials too. They don't share their thinking with us, so uh, that may very well be the general perception. Certainly, it makes a lot of sense. Um, 
we don't really know why these animal mutilations take place. Some people have speculated that it's to gather DNA samples right. or whatever, and of course you can do that to humans without ripping them apart. Exactly. If you want to. Yeah. So just hang around a barber shop. Yeah. <laughs> and, Doc- yeah. Yeah. Hair is an easy thing to extract Thanks. DNA from. Dr. Don, please stand by, sir. We have to take our final break. Exxon Nation, Dr. Don Burleson, who is the director of the New York State branch of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. His website is www.blackmesopress.com, and we'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. Don Burleson is our special guest, www.blackmesopress.com. He is the State of New Mexico Director for MUFON, and once again, blackmesopress.com. What do you say to people who say that UFOs couldn't be visiting us because the distances between other star systems and our little planet are way too far? Well, you know, the thing is, we probably shouldn't assume that we know everything at this Mm -hmm. point that there is to know about physics, you know. I mean, yeah, we'd have a hard time making a trip like that with yep. the, the technology we have right now. But, I mean, who knows what somebody has, you know, that's a million years ahead of us. Uh, what about teleportation? You know, we're already beginning to even experiment with that ourselves a little bit. We've teleported things like photons. You know, uh, there was an experiment where a photon was, tele- was, was teleported 500 meters, and we did that ourselves. And so what if somebody's been around for millions of years, maybe longer than we have, could they teleport whole whole organisms and whole objects, well, mm-hmm. who knows? Uh, wormholes, you know, there's a great deal about physics that we're still learning. And it's funny that, that you know, Carl Sagan, the astronomer, used to say that he, although he believed the universe was teeming with life, probably, uh, he didn't think any of it was visiting us because, you know, uh, the distances were too great and so forth. But he knew better than that because because that was just what he said in, in, in public. He had to say that. Uh he told Alan Hynek one time, when they were they were about to go on a TV show together, that uh, they were kind of backstage. That that um, he knew he knew perfectly well some UFOs were extraterrestrial, but he couldn't very well talk about that in public because he had his his grant funding at Cornell to worry about and so on. You know, unreal. And so and so you know we 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 don't know everything there is to know about science at this point, and and there may be creatures out hmm. there that know a great deal more. What would you like to leave uh, a message for the Exo Nation with tonight? A message? Well, yeah. What would you like to well, leave them with? Their, your final thoughts? Oh, watch the skies. <laughs> um, think how interesting it would be for one of them to land on the White House lawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, keep it scientific. You know, basically, uh, if you're going to, you know, observe these things, be a careful observer. Uh, be a skeptical observer, you know. Uh, um, I hate it when people say to me, I was out looking for flying saucers, and I think I found them. Well, of course you, you saw one if you were looking for them, but uh, <laughs> what you see when you're not looking for one is what's important. Uh, be objective. Uh, think of this as a science, because at its best, that's what it should be. And what is the uh, website for MUFON to file a report online? That's just the MUFON.com. All right, Doc. There'll, there'll be a place in there to, to go and, 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 and submit a siding report. And uh, as I said, you know, a, an investigator gets assigned, and uh, we can take it from there. I want to thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Don. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. And I look, forward to the ne- I look forward to the next time you and I meet together back here in the X-Zone. Thank you. Good night, Dr. Don. Exo Nation, Dr. Don Burleson has been my guest this hour. www.blackmesopress.com. And don't forget, if you'd like to file an online UFO report, www.mufon.com. I'll be back after the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour. Don't go away. <laughs> 